Today we're going to talk about quantum computing and where we are. Uh, my name is Tim Sarowitz. I'm the director of the training program for the Linux Foundation. So I got to approve my own talk. So if it's horrible, you know how it slipped through. Uh, it uh, went back to me. But uh, hopefully, hopefully it's awesome and you tell all your friends, of course. But uh, what we're going to do in this talk is talk about quantum computing. Uh, and the idea behind it is to, to get you started. There's a lot of stuff going on. That's what this whole talk is about, is to dispel some of the, the myths about it. So jumping right in. Now, ironically, it looks perfect. This slide has graphics on it until I present it. So, which there's an irony to it because it's noise to signal. It's in many ways a sign of where quantum computing is as well. If you know anything about noise and signal, you've ever seen a, a grainy TV a station with lines across it. That's what this graphic looks like if I don't uh, present it. Um, with quantum computing, figuring out what is true, what is aspirational, and what is completely made up is very difficult. Uh, I recently wrote a course on quantum computing, and I started it with, as I do with most of my research projects, you know, reading a lot, working with it, and then finding experts to communicate with. I uh, found some experts, and I said, well, this is what I have so far. You know, help me understand. And uh, they were like, nope, 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 not true, not true. And I was thinking, OK, maybe it's just this one guy. So I went to somebody else, and they had a different list of stuff that wasn't true. Uh, and so this is where I realized is that the majority of the information that you're going to find on quantum computing is suspect. That's, that's, I think that's the polite way of putting that maybe it is accurate, maybe it's not. Uh, some of it was definitely aspirational. So there's organizations that are saying, yes, someday this will be true for us. So, yes, question. Or maybe it's true and false at the same time. Th there you go. That's perfect. Yes, you understand. You don't need to be here. You already understand quantum. Uh, so absolutely, that's entirely the possibility. But uh, as a result, um, something that I, I, I like to start with this as I talk about quantum, because I have gotten into, let's say, heated discussions with people where they're like, no, this is absolutely it. And they'll say, here are four different sites that are talking about the same issue. And then you go to a different site, and it proves through uh, empirical testing that's not quite accurate. So something's been repeated so much that it's taken as truth, even though it's not. And part of the reason is just where we are. There are some important terms when it comes to understanding uh, quantum computing based in quantum mechanics. And uh, we don't have enough time nor either the knowledge to go into the details of quantum mechanics, but these are the main concepts. This is where we're trying to get uh, with that. Uh, quantum computing is uh, taking advantage of a nature of really, really small objects, these, these particles. What we're trying to get are the first two terms, so entanglement and superposition. When you get to this very, very, very small scale, you can knock parts of an object off from one another. They still have this relationship, even though they're no longer together. Their relationship continues even if they're very far apart. For example, you could be tied in a quantum nature to this object, and it could be a million miles away. The tie is interesting in that if I change the nature of one of those particles that I, I split off that are entangled with one another, when I change this particle, no matter how far away that other particle is, it instantly changes. So in the universe, these things must be in some sort of math with each other. And no matter how far apart they are, they have to be in a, in a kind of agreement. So what a quantum computer basically is, is we take as many of these little tiny objects as we can, we entangle them with each other, then by causing something to happen to one of them or two of them or a group of them, the rest will react in concert with it. So the more things that I can entangle, the more complex of a calculation I can do. And because it's not something that's it's slow, I don't have to go through an iteration, it's, it's near immediate, or it is immediate in the quantum uh, concept, that I can do these massive potential calculations without needing to do an iterative uh, way of doing it. Right now, a typical computer, you want to calculate a, a large number, you have a processor, takes a little bit of data, does a calculation, takes a little bit of data, calculation, saves, saves it in a cache, and it just does that whole bunch. 
I can have multiple processes. I have a processor farm. I can have lots of servers, but they're still doing one calculation at a time. If I want to change one of these parameters, I say, uh, okay, I, I, want to, I have 50 ships going to 40 ports. I want to find the most fuel efficient way of getting them there. Okay? And then I want to add weather in. Okay, you could probably figure that out. A big computer could definitely figure that out eventually. What if one of my ships goes, you know, goes down? The engine go, has a problem. The weather changes. Who knew that the weather could change? Well, in a classical computer, a modern classical computer, you, it starts to grab the bits, it starts to recalculate, and sure, I have a giant farm of these calculating, working on it, working on it. With a quantum system, you can change a parameter, and because they are entangled with one another, the entire relationship becomes known at that moment. So what a classical computer might take 10,000 years to recalculate, I would have in 200 seconds. So now most people talk about quantum computing and they talk about speed. And speed is definitely one of the main reasons we like quantum computing. But the, another thing that I'd like you guys to leave with is an understanding that quantum can solve problems in such a fashion that a standard computer cannot. So we can do things differently. And we'll talk about this more. The, the nature of these, these items also goes into something called superposition. And as talked about, you know, you're both here and not here simultaneously. It's uh, the nature of these quantum objects is that in the, in the quantum sense, the tiny, tiny sense, they are actually in motion. So, uh, for example, hopefully you know what, a, what I would call a soccer ball. Uh, here, strangely, you guys have a different name for it, but a football, uh, you have those panels. If you were to color one of those panels and kick the ball, seeing it roll down the, the field, you would notice that, that the ball might be kind of rotating one direction, another direction, and going through the field. So if you followed that panel, it'd be in some area. When I measure it, I could tell you, is it on the top half or the bottom half? No matter what, I'm still getting a one or a zero in that calculation. But as soon as I stop the ball, it's no longer in motion. That's the nature of these quantum objects. They're going through space. They are entangled with each other, so they, they affect each other, but I don't know where they are until I measure it. Unlike a traditional computer, where I have some sort of forensics, I could say it went through this gate, it did this cache hit, something like that, you inherently can't with quantum objects. Because as soon as you measure it, they leave their quantum state of being many places, potentially. And we're talking about the poten you know, the, where they might be, where they probably are. And as a result, you can't know how you got there. <laughs> so that, I, I'm, I'm getting into a little deep into how these objects work. But these two terms are probably the most important things to really understand about quantum computing and why it's not just a faster computer. That we're leveraging this relationship that can be very, very far apart and is, is a probability of where something is that you only know when you measure it. So there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more that goes into this, but the, hopefully that's enough where you go, okay, it's not just a faster computer. It's not a faster processor. It's a different way of figuring something out. Now there's some other terms here, quantum supremacy, quantum advantage. If uh, it's sort of like uh, if you're, you know, what editor, text editor is better, Vim or Emacs? Uh, you know, if I were to ask, I'm sure that we'd have a flame war going and there'd be loud shouts of obviously only, you know, if you're smart, you use Emacs. And somebody's like, I use Nano. So that's the same thing that happens here with these terms. So be aware that depending on who you ask, you'll get a different uh, answer. So the general, and I mean that in the strictest, like, kind of way of looking at it is uh, the, the advantage is typically seen as a, uh, a speed up. It's faster than if you did it with a supercomputer. The supremacy is it's doing it so much faster, so much different that you really couldn't do it with a, even a really big supercomputer today. So it would take 10,000 years to calculate something. Okay, that if I had a, a massive, uh, you know, Cray running 8,000 nodes, it would take me 10,000 years, but I can do it in, in a couple minutes with my quantum machine. That's supremacy. There are, there are large organizations, for example, uh, just about everybody in the quantum game, but uh, Google with their Sycamore 
system or processor said, we have achieved it a couple years back. And, and, and you know, it, it looked good. There's a couple things to be aware of. One, a different research uh, agency just proved that that algorithm could be solved in uh, 20 hours with their supercomputer. So uh, it wasn't quite uh, true yet. And the algorithm itself. Right now, quantum machines are solving an algorithm that is written to make the quantum machine look good. It is in no way useful. It does nothing you'd ever want it to do. The only thing this algorithm does is make the quantum machine look fast. Okay? So these terms, you know, if, if, I, if, I, if I had a, 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 a you know, billion dollars and I was, had my own quantum machine, I would go and say, I have achieved it. But if you ask, well, what are we really talking about here? It's, well, I, I wrote this thing that oh, my, I'm the only one that knows it. And, and therefore, I'm the only one that has the answer. It's sort of like, uh, I'm thinking of a number. Uh, guess it, and you say five. Like, nope, it's not that. Well, of course, you know, I, you don't know what the you know nobody knows what the number is. I, I'm the one who tells you what it is. So be aware that these terms are fluid, and the real value behind them ha still has some question. We're not doing anything great yet with quantum machines today. This is what a modern computer looks like. You know, just a have a tower, you pop the top off, the side off, and it's going to look like this. And you know, you have a processor that has a big heat sink on it. You have fans, you have memory, you have ROM chips, you have uh, a bus, you have many buses that are all communicating with each other. This is, this is your typical uh, setup that you would most likely have. Uh, and hopefully we're aware of what these components are. We have storage, okay? we have long-term storage with a disk someplace. Then we have various levels of cache, you know, DIMMs, and they're, they're faster and better, but less capacity. Then we go to various types of cache and onboard cache and so forth. But there's a lot that goes into a modern computer. And we need firmware and like a BIOS to help run it. And then when I use it and I type something at the shell, I'm actually operating at a pretty high level. I'm leveraging these libraries, these calls, the firmware, till it gets down to a machine code to actually run that hardware. I, 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 do, I no longer do anything in machine code or assembler. Uh, some of you still might, but I don't. And most people, if you took the entire IT, they'd say, yeah, I work in C, I work in Java. That's, that's at the top of the, the building, and this is in the basement, and there's a lot in the middle. So this is a classical machine. Uh, this is an example of a quantum computer, or is it? You'll see this kind of photo all the time. Like IBM has some really great stuff. They show that they have beautiful looking machines. This is indeed, I guess you could say, a quantum computer. Uh, that's actually a refrigeration unit. You are looking at a very, very expensive refrigerator. At the very bottom of this, there is a processor about the size of a of a credit card. That's the only quantum thing there. The rest of it, so when they show these beautiful setups, like that, that's a beautiful, like this is a beautiful photo of, of, of a what, you know, oh, look at my quantum computer. This is what cost our company $10 billion. And actually, it just cools these things down, these very, very small objects down, as it goes, it's, it's a dilution refrigerator, I can't remember the exact term, but basically as that object gets lower and lower and lower, it also lowers in temperature, until at the very, very bottom, there's a chip this big that is a quantum processor. And that's what we probably should be calling it today. That doesn't sound so interesting though, so we, you know, we use terms that may not be 100% accurate for anybody else. So this is an example of what a, and there's, there's different types of quantum computers too, uh, but this is, this is actually what's there in that graphic. That's the quantum thing that's entangling those objects, talk about entanglement, so, and then measuring it. That's it. Where's the bus that connects it? Where's the firmware? Where's the ROM chip? Where's the hard drive? We don't have it. It does not exist. So, we, as data scientists and engineers, would have to figure out what is going to be calculated and insert into that processor all the different values, set up all the gates, and get a calculation from it. They sometimes call that a shot, where you, we do all the work someplace else, we bring it together, there's nothing automated. We don't have the, these libraries are just being written now. 
So in this example, we kind of have a hard drive when it comes to quantum because it's sort of like network storage that we use now. It's not local to my machine. I make a call someplace else and I retrieve it. Well, that's what we do with quantum machines. That, that nice big refrigerator, those values are coming from someplace else and being pushed into the processor. So a quantum computer today is just a processor. No, well, it's a quantum machine. It's still a big thing. I'm not, I'm not trying to unplay it like it's, it's the same thing as your cell phone, but it is not a real computer that everybody else would assume you're talking about. There are no caches. There is no firmware. Everything is basically done someplace else and then inserted into that processor. Now, this is all being worked on, just not there yet. There are a lot of people working in this field Billions and billions and billions for 20, 30 years are, have been invested trying to figure out how do we do this. So in this case, there, and I, you know, I can go through them, but people are trying to figure out how do I get this entangled bit such that I can work with it? Because how these things are entangled and how they're working and how small they are and how fragile they are to things causes it to be very difficult. If, uh, if you had a... Um, if you had a, a number in your mind, we're talking about these entangled bits and how far we are, and we're, I, I think I did the math and it's almost a trillion dollars over 30 years have been spent, something like that. Um, how many entangled bits do you think we're up to now that, we, that are in that relationship I talked about? Anybody have an idea the number we're at? Can somebody say four? 16, 16, so somebody who knows. So we're up to 16. Normally when I ask people, of course, it's a little, you're more likely to be associated with quantum here, but people are like, oh, I don't know, it's probably in the millions, right? It's 16. So imagine a, a computer that you might have that has 16 uh, different values that you could calculate, so 16 live wires. Okay. So we're, we're still working on stuff, but these are all attempts, and there's people who say we've made it, and we're there, and then further research, well, not quite there, but I'm sure it will work well. We have a simulator that we are so sure of it that we're gonna show you this simulator, and someday it will work. So there's, there's a large number of these out there, and many people working on it. There's many different types of quantum machines as well, so annealers and so forth, that are typically built to solve a certain type of problem as well. We are not yet at the universal stage. Uh, the, the universal quantum, which is what your cell phone, your typical laptop is, that you have the libraries, you have everything you need, you can throw it just about any kind of problem you want, and it will figure it out. You might have some specialty hardware, a GPU or something for some type of, of object, but we're trying to get to universal quantum where, yeah, whatever it is you need done, you want to look at a photo, great, here's a photo, you want to edit something, you can do whatever it is. Right now, we're building entire quantum machines to solve one particular problem. Like I mentioned, that, that one algorithm that only runs and does nothing else, that's what they're building a quantum machine to solve is, is that type of algorithm. Part of the reason is what's called noise. When you're dealing with these quantum objects that are really, really small, they're affected by stuff like the things in the universe. Sort of like when your cell phone doesn't work because there's some sort of, of electromagnetic interference or something, well, that's something that's really durable and large. You take those kind of same fields that just exist in the universe and you put it into something that's really, really tiny and the smallest adjustment causes it all to, to basically fall apart or to get into what they call decoherence. So there's a lot of challenges. Where we are right now is trying to get those 16 entangled bits to stay near each other for long enough so that I can get some value out of it. Because right now it's like, yes, they were next to each other for you know, one one thousandth of a second. Awesome, and, and that's, that's great. I mean, it's, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, saying that's not a great thing. It's just, if you're thinking about it like, is it as powerful as my laptop, we're not quite there yet. Uh, and one of the ways to explain this, and again, this is meant for folks who may not be as, as technical. If I, had, if I had a pool and I were to throw uh, a ball into it, that, that is my, let's just say that's my, my qubit my quantum bit. The goal of a quantum machine is to throw some number of balls in the water, okay, and then to affect them. And how they get affected, some use lasers, some use little uh, buffets of microwave energy. So imagine you have several of these beach balls in a pool, then you are splashing around the edge. And the idea being is that if I and some friends 
splash just right, we could set up a standing wave such that one of those beach balls would be higher than the rest. That's effectively what we're trying to have, where, where we're going with these quantum machines. That I have these bits that are related to each other, and I'm affecting it such that they are able to tell a difference between them. That this is a, a high value, that's a low value. Now, imagine that you're doing this on a day like, you know, a category two hurricane. So you're at your pool, and there's 60 mile an hour winds going on, and you have beach balls in there, and you and your friends are trying to get a standing wave going. You'd be hard pressed to get one ball to be on a wave at all, never mind two balls that are connected to each other, or 16, or the millions you'll probably need to have some sort of approximation of a useful computer. So that is basically impossible. Plus, you have somebody else with a fan that's trying to get that to spin in a particular direction, and the ball next to it to spin in a different direction so that it can affect everybody else. That's why, with 30 years and trillion dollars, we haven't had a lot of success with quantum machines. This is what we're trying to do. So, of course, in this case, you know that it basically wouldn't happen. And that's why we have that giant refrigerator. We can take these objects and we can cool them down to near absolute zero. And by near, it's pretty much just far enough above, like one one thousandth of a Kelvin above absolute zero, such that wherever they happen to be in space, it's a quantum object, I can't tell. I would ruin the thing, the calculation, if I measured it. So I have to just kind of guess where it is. And that's the whole point, the probability of what it is. So I freeze it. That's why I have this big freezer. So these objects aren't even vibrating in the quantum state. You know, that the soccer ball that's going down the field in some kind of interesting way. So we freeze it. Well, so this is one of the ways of doing it. So we, we freeze it really, really cold so that it's almost not moving. So now if I, th if I threw the, the ball, even though it's a hurricane out still, but now that ball's not moving anymore, not moving much. Now I have a better chance of getting it to be on a standing wave because the water itself is even frozen. So we're, we're having to work pretty hard, but every time I splash, well, this ball went up in a standing wave, but then that affected everybody else, and that wave kicked it out of, it gets complex pretty fast. And, and you're still in that hurricane. That's all the, the, the forces of nature, the, the guy who bumps the table, the, the, the cell phone that goes off, all of those things are potential things affecting your beach ball. So this is why it's not been easy. It's not like these, these engineers are just sitting around like, oh yeah, well, you know, we, we solved it 20 years ago, but let's milk it. No, it, there's a lot that you have to do to get all of these things to be in, a, in a, some sort of matrix that you can then affect to get a calculation from it. And that's why, if you think about it, if you got 16 beach balls to be in standing waves in relationship with each other in a hurricane, people would be really impressed with you. Okay? So that's where we are, basically, with with our quantum machines, and that's why we have that big refrigerator, is to understand what this is. Okay? Now, these machines are not inexpensive. No computer was inexpensive, and uh, especially at first. You, the, the, the vacuum tube, then the transistor came out, and they got a lot smaller. There was economies of scale, but for example, today, mainframes are still not inexpensive. They, they tend to be very expensive things. So, uh, my, this is me guessing, this is me uh, with my aspirational thought, is that very likely as quantum uh, matures, and as far as that's concerned, uh, my, my uh, completely uh, novice guess, not quite complete, but my novice guess is that we're going to have to get those entangled bits good enough, uh, probably in the hundreds or thousands, so that the computer can help us figure out how to entangle more. So we're going to have to get a, a quantum machine smart enough to, to tell me how to entangle more. And then we'll actually get to the millions that we'll need. Uh, so it's, it's the nature of it. But in the meantime, I think where we're going to be eventually is what mainframes are today. So a cloud provider will use it. You'll have something, and I, I sell, I realize here I should have said mobile. Your mobile device, uh, your, your internet of things, will use that quantum machine. They're just not going to have it local. Your cell phone probably well, not in, in our lifetimes, will not have a quantum chip on it. Uh, instead, there's just going to be a, an API call behind the scenes. You have no idea about it, and it will make a call someplace to a quantum machine that will do the calculation for you and give you the answer back. So we will have quantum use, 
via our, our cell phones, but we're not going to actually have, I don't think. But I'm sure in the 60s, 1960s, they're like, nobody's going to have a, you know, a computer at home. No one will need more than 64K of memory. These were all things that were said in the 1960s. So here, here I am saying, no one will ever, and, and I, I hope that I'm, I'm proven wrong very quickly. Uh, that, that it happens and we're there. But I think we're going to end up with some sort of, of hybrid uh, future. Uh, now, as much as I've said what's not working, you can do some work with quantum today. There's, there's two of these pages. These are all uh, different companies that are building or providing access to quantum machines. The, for the first one I listed there, uh, they, were, they, they happened to be in the town I live in as well, so that was kind of handy to have somebody to drive over and talk to. Uh, but what's neat about Strangeworks uh, is, what a great num name, right, is um, that they call themselves the Switzerland of quantum, that you go to one place and they, their job is to keep track of everybody else, basically, and through that one website, you can actually schedule a job to run on various either simulators or some companies like IBM has real quantum systems that you can run an algorithm on. So you have like an entangled bit and you can kind of cause it to happen. And you're not there obviously, but you, you know, remotely you see lights blink and you just did something with a quantum machine. So Strangeworks, if you're gonna go visit one site, start there and they have some pretty neat stuff uh, going on. These are all other companies. So there's a lot of people in this space. That's the first page of it. Here's another page of it. Uh, each one has something special. I mentioned that there's 12 or 15 different types of quantum computers, each with a particular goal or target. And that's, that's what some of this is as well. And I'll upload my slides to the, I realized I forgot to do that. I'll upload the slides to the website, Sketch, so you can download them and get this list. Because uh, I know Frantically taking photos or scribbling like mad is uh, not always so easy. So you can indeed work with uh, quantum today, uh, and there are some neat things that you can do. Now, this is an area that, now that we have a general idea of where quantum is, that we're not quite to the point of really having useful quantum. Uh, a lot of times when decision makers get to that point, they're like, so you're telling me it's uh, 10 or 20 billion dollar investment to get something that's a very expensive refrigerator that will make an algorithm look good. Okay, so I'm not too worried about it now. Move on with my, my day and worry about important stuff. Um, but we should all be worried about, well, Im impressed, excited about quantum, uh, specifically for security. My guess is that we are three to five years from usable quantum. Maybe not usable in the sense of where we want to be, that universal quantum that just does all things, but in a very purpose-driven use. And I think that the first use will be encryption and decryption. So people are like, well, five years, that's forever, in, especially in IT. I'm not going to worry about it. But uh, for one, most organizations today, their encryption schemes will not be enough. Yeah, that, that's, that's, they haven't chosen. They said, what's the smallest that works for today? That's pretty much the way we always approach stuff, what works for today. But if I'm a, a, a state, uh, some, some big country in the world that may not be terribly friendly with IT and, and its neighbors, I could start recording and collecting your encrypted data today. And when I get that quantum machine that's built with the purpose of decrypting things, I could then start going through and decrypting all of it. So this is where if you went to your government, if you went to your corporation, if you went to your CEO, your, you know, whoever it is, and you said all of our intellectual property will be readable by somebody uh, in three years. Uh, you know, and they're reading it, to, they're, like they're getting it today, they're gonna read it in three years. Is this a problem? Hopefully, all of them are like, that's a huge problem. All your communications, we could you know, very easily collect it. And right now, we're like, oh, it's, you can't read it, so it's no big deal. It would take years, 10,000 years to decrypt this, this data. So I'm not worried about it. But I can record it now, and then three years, five years. And by the way, we won't know until much later. Uh, you know, it's the small companies, the innovators, they're going to tell everybody right away because they're, you know, they want to go public and so forth. They're eager to get it out. But the big money is coming from governments that are spending the tens of billions of dollars on this. And if I get a working quantum machine that can decrypt 
I'm not gonna tell anybody. That's the last thing I'm gonna do. So for all we know, it's happened already. And they are decrypting stuff live as it goes through the, the, uh, the machine. So it's, it's one of those, those areas that we have to start today knowing that this is company. It is going to happen, it's coming. I don't know if it's three years, I don't know if it's five years, but it will happen. Almost everybody agrees. There's people who think quantum will never happen, but I think it will. So one of the things I'd like you, another item I'd like you to leave with is that uh, NIST, uh, which is a US government agency that does standards. NIST recently, a couple weeks ago, came out with four new encryption um, protocols, standards that are quantum resistant. They're coming out with another four, and so it's for like signatures, so signing stuff, and some encryption types. Today, you should start to change your software so that, not that you're gonna, I, I don't encourage you to use those four standards. What I want you, what I really like you guys to do is to change your software so that whatever those software settings are, they're modular. So that as quantum changes, and we realize that, oh, 512 bits, that's not gonna be enough. That you don't have to rebuild everything. They say, okay, well, that's fine. It's, it's gonna be a call to something. I will just change it out. Okay, take out that module, that package, a couple days later. Right now, most large corporations, every government, has no idea what encryption they're using. They don't know who to ask what encryption they're using. So how are you gonna fix that if you don't even know what it is and you don't know who to ask? So today, we, all of our organizations should be figuring out, are we, well, are we using encryption to start with? That's a great question to ask. Are we secure at all? If we are using encryption, what is it? Who's responsible for it? And how do I change it if I need to? And by the way, you need to. So all the software from this point moving forward, I wanna encourage you to say, we're gonna to need to change this soon. Most government agencies measure this change, and I know this because I've done research on it, since the 1960s, as they've tried to make changes with their IT structure, they measure change in decades. So that means if they're not encrypted now, by the time they fixed it, quantum will have been useful for at least five years, and their data is vulnerable. Now, the smaller the organization, the more agile you are, but think about, you know, uh, people have been rewriting their applications to embrace the cloud. We need you know, decoupled transient microservices for Kubernetes. And you know, people have these legacy apps that they've had forever. And like, well, we don't wanna rewrite that. That's gonna take forever. How do we just containerize my you know, 10 gig VM and we'll just run it in Kubernetes, it'll be better, right? That's already a, a problem. Can you imagine tearing that thing apart to figure out what the encryption is inside? So as you're rewriting all your software for the cloud to do it properly, think about this. Are we secure and can we change our security? Is that as decoupled and transient as everything else should be in my environment? Um, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's agi quantum agility is what it's, it's called typically. So if you wanna do some research, you can hit NIST and do a search for it. But it's really important that we start, we'll start five years ago, but you know, they, there's an adage, you know, what's the best time to plant a tree for shade? It's 20 years ago. The second best time is today when you need it. You know, mines will start today because uh, it's not going to get any better. That's where we should all be with our uh, security systems. There are some societal considerations as well. Um, and this, this is one of those areas that, uh, that we get into the, the wishfulness. Um, the change that will come when quantum works. When the transistor was created, uh, people, again, nobody will need more than 64K of memory. That was a, a famous Microsoft line. Uh, the, we're gonna go through that same phase here. The, the way I would put it to make it a little bit more easy to understand, uh, if, if I wanna go someplace faster, which again is what we usually associate with quantum, uh, I can run a certain speed. I don't run very fast, so, you know, I don't, let's see. If I'm lucky, two miles an hour in me running. Uh, if I wanna go faster, I'm gonna hop on a bike, and the way I pedal, maybe five miles an hour. Then I go to a car, then a bullet train. I'm going across the earth faster and faster. So then somebody says, why don't you take a rocket ship? Yes, I would get there faster. It's true. 
And that's what quantum will be. It will be like a rocket ship. Uh, the current estimation is 186 million times faster, which is a number I think was pretty much made up. But that's what we've all agreed to. So 186 million times faster than existing technology. But the difference is a space shuttle can you know, get you across the, the Earth. It can also go to the moon and go to Mars. Quantum systems are going to be like that. Now, this area, if you want to, and I would encourage you to start reading up on it, this is where you get into these very interesting takes on stuff. And it's people like me just basically making stuff up. But um, the, the, what it will do and what it means to us is because, as I mentioned, it's not just faster. It's a different type of computer. So um, you've probably heard the term, uh, if you know anything about quantum, spooky at a distance. Okay. How many people have heard spooky at a distance? Just to get an idea. Okay, about half of you have heard this term before. Something I learned in my research, if you see this in an article, probably not a good article. <laughs> okay, because it means that author really didn't know. It's like, well, this is a good quote. Einstein said it, so I'll seem smart if I include it. So spooky at a distance, I have learned after reading hundreds, not thousands of articles, is a sign that this isn't a real article. FYI. And if you're, ever, if you're a quantum researcher, don't use that quote anymore. Uh, but the, uh, the idea behind that is that it's, it's uh, think of the human brain, and that's probably the best example. If I ask you, what's the weather like? Now, if I ask you here, you're like, oh, I don't know why Tim cares what the weather's like. But if I was in my house and I open up the, the, the closet where we keep our rain gear, if I say, what's the weather like today? You're like, oh, you don't need your umbrella. You've answered a different question. This is what quantum machines will do. That you will say, this drug, we want this drug to cure cancer. Will it fold in such a fashion that it will join this genetic thing of, of a cancerous cell and take care of it but not harm somebody else? So you're trying to do a drug trial with a quantum machine, and that's something that's being done right now. They're, they're desperate to get this faster, better way of looking at it. Imagine if you ask the quantum machine, does this particular drug work on cancer? Does it cure cancer? And instead, the answer that comes back from your quantum machine is, this is the way to prevent cancer from happening. So if you take this drug, you'll never get cancer. That like, you asked for what the weather is, and you said you don't need an umbrella. That's what that's what it's looking like. Quantum will be able to do. It will it will answer the question you meant to ask. And this is where people are like, this sounds like you might be drinking a little bit too much. You know, a little had too much time at the pub last night, and uh, hasn't worn off yet. Um, the guy D Wave was one of the big companies uh, that does quantum, and he's a serious person. He's he's not you know he's not out there. Um, it, it's uh, he thinks, and I'm going to put words in his mouth, but there's, he has a talk on this, that, uh, that quantum machines are actually making calls to alternate universes. And we are getting answers from a different universe instead, in that whatever that micro, you know, the, the, the positioning is, that when we, we actually go and measure it, we're measuring some universe. And because of entanglement, if we change this, we can actually get a different measurement from someplace else. Though we might be entangled to all of the, the cells in our body are entangled someplace else in the universe. So it gets kind of deep here. But the, the thing is, is that we don't really know why it works the way it works. We don't know any of this stuff. So we don't know, and so far, it's been very promising that we're going to get a different answer back than what we wanted. He does go on, just to, to tell you, he does go on to talk about angry other beings in those other universes. So, you know, do, you know little, uh, little forewarning there. Anybody know who Cthulhu is, the deep one? Yeah, so he's like, you know, I think there's going to be a deep one. He's going to come through the universe. If we keep bothering them, that he's going to come find us, and, uh, and there's going to be problems. So I wanted to give you the wide range from aspirational to this mythical creature like Hellboy will come through this portal and come for us if we use quantum machines. So there's a wide range involved. I, I'm more towards the we're going to use them rather than uh, worrying about Hellboy showing up. Uh, but <laughs> education is essential. And one of the things I want to leave you guys with is understanding that we should be learning about entanglement. We should be learning about these things, not just here as adults in the IT industry. Our kids should start learning about it. With previous systems, a transistor was built and a computer was built. It was done one after another. Right now, researchers are doing it all at the same time. 
So there's people who are working at the hardware, there's people writing OSs, it's showing up fast. So your kids should start learning about it, high schools, colleges, everybody should understand it. It will change our culture as much as the transistor. Okay. Uh, so what next? As I mentioned, some countries might already be using quantum, we won't know. And we won't know until probably it's too late. But basically keep up with the, what articles you can. Scientific articles are good, but again, if you see spooky at a distance, I've learned uh, you might want to keep looking someplace else. Thanks very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. Sure. So the question was, uh, you know, in three to five years, how fast are we talking? What can we do with it? Oh, uh, like real time. Yeah. No, that's that's just it. Quantum is again 186 million times faster. So if I have a data stream that's let's say using 120-bit encryption, and I'm able to capture the data stream, I would be reading it in real time as it goes by. Now. Okay, I go to 512, I go to 1024 bits of encryption. Okay, now, now we're talking, okay, if they're gonna do it with a quantum machine, it might take months or years. Uh, but how many people are using 1024 bit encryption for their cell phone calls and communications? You know, how many people are using one time pads? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a quantum resistant technology. I, I use an organic source, you know, source of entropy, I generate numbers on one place, and then I copy them, like using a photocopy machine, and nothing goes on the internet, and I, I fly it someplace else, and then they type it in over there. That's one way that's quantum resistant, because there's no way you would know what those are. Not terribly efficient, but that's why we don't, well, we actually do use that in some places, but most people don't, okay? Well, again, thanks very much, and uh, I'll see you around the conference. Oh, yeah, the emulators, uh, the Strangeworks is about probably the best place to go for those emulators um, because uh, basically people have said, this is what we think a quantum bit will look like, this is what we think a quantum gate will look like, and they've done it in software. Uh, so uh, it's effectively the same as if you were to, to kind of take out Visio and start drawing a diagram and say, well, this is the way it shall work. There are some neat stuff, but Strangeworks is the very best site to go to because they have all the, the windows into real and simulated quantum machines. Absolutely. The, the question was for the rest of you is, uh, won't we need new languages? And we absolutely will. And they're being worked on. So Microsoft has something that I've just, I had it in my head. It's Quizlet. There's, there's four or five languages in active development right now. Uh, QIR is a, the, a QIR Alliance is a group of people that are doing just that, is how do we get languages so once this becomes available, we'll have it. So look up QIR Alliance. And I got the stop function, so I have to get off the stage now. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.